Steve Day is a former commander of Canada's Joint Task Force to Special Forces Unit. He's now president of Radical Ventures Canada. Day has taught national resistance and resilience training to a number of Eastern European countries. Hey, Steve, good to have you back with us. I appreciate your time. Let's get into this question of the no-fly zone because Mr. Poroshenko earlier on our program also talked about it. Numerous Ukrainian representatives on the program over this week have said this is what we really need. It was a bit surprising to hear General Hilliard take that posture because so far NATO countries have really resisted it, saying like that amounts to shooting down Russian aircraft. That is hugely escalatory and could start you know, a, a series of events that would be really, really, really even more damaging than what's already occurred. Where do you sit on that? So maybe, Vashti, if I could just start, if we could start at the, the, the strategic level down to the tactical really quickly to make sure folks understand what it is exactly we're talking about. So first of all, NATO is a 30-nation alliance, and every nation has a veto. So if one nation says we're not going to do that, guess what? We're not going to do that as much as we may want to do that as alliance. Secondly, there's only one nation in the world that can enforce and even put in place a no-fly zone, and that's the United States. Maybe Russia and maybe China could do that, but really only the Americans have the technology, the capacity, and the capability to actually enforce a no-fly zone. Other partners can clearly come in and do that, but really the U.S. Um, or you know uh, the Russians or Chinese, but you know, there's a quite a bit of a question about that in a near peer scenario. Third point, it needs to be a strategy. We can't just come up with good ideas, throw them against the uh, the wall here, see what sticks. The question should be is, what is the West strategy to support Ukraine? And then let's figure out the right resources and the methods to bring those resources to bear. And I've yet to hear a strategy about how we're gonna support and defend Ukraine. Once we have the strategy, then we'll figure out what resources we bring in, bring into the fight, or more importantly, what risk we're willing to accept as the West. And then lastly, when we actually talk about a no-fly zone, let, let's get down to brass tacks. There's clearly the column of air above the country that you're trying to establish that no-fly zone over, but we also need to build in the land buffer around it mm -hmm. so that all the Russian air defense systems are not going to be able to engage our aircraft if we were to put a no-fly zone into effect. So there's really clearing that buffer, establishing it, then you got to patrol it, and then you got to be very serious about whether you're going to engage those Russian aircraft or not. On the question of strategy, if, if I sort of think about all the things that I've heard said by various leaders, what I, I guess I would deduct would be do everything we can to support them in their resistance against, against Russian troops, except for uh, put troops in there or our own troops in there or, you know, do the no fly zone thing. Is that a strategy? Like what would a strategy look like from your perspective? Why do you think it's absent? Well, I think from a strategy perspective, what are the ends? What are we trying to achieve and what what conditions need to be set for NATO or Ukraine or the West to be happy and declare victory? I, I don't know what those are right now. Secondly, what means, what resources are willing to throw at it? And thirdly, the ways, how are we going to employ those various resources? So what I do think the West is doing very well is we are using a series of non-military means, you know, energy, economic factors, um, propaganda and or information operations and re re uh, resourcing and supporting that indigenous or that Ukrainian um, force that's on the ground and trying to support them defend their own terrain. So we're really in a very interesting space and we haven't had enough discussion about what does victory look like for the West? I just have a minute left, Steve, but but I did want to get your read on the, the situation from a military perspective as it stands right now. We see Russia making some big gains. The New York Times talking about, you know, the first city to fall. Where, where do you see the trajectory right now? Well, I think they'll continue to encircle the major cities because I believe part of their strategy, and this is just my assessment, is the regime change. Cut off the, the head of the Ukrainian apparatus, and then hopefully those brave Ukrainian citizens will disperse. I'm not convinced they're going to do that based on what we're hearing. I think these men and women are incredibly brave and are, are on the front line of the great conflict between democracies and those autocratic nations or despots, ter uh, dictators, or, or tyrannical leaders. And it's important that 
um, we understand that our global adversaries are watching this first battle and seeing how, and I say battle, Ukraine is the first battle in a global conflict. Okay, I'll leave it there. Steve, appreciate your insights. As always, we'll be talking to you frequently, I imagine, over the coming weeks. Thanks a lot. That's Steve Day. He's a former commander of Canada's JTF-2 Special Forces Unit. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.